Uh, good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to the April 4th, 2022 Pitt County Board of Commissioners meeting. Uh, this time I'd like to go ahead and call the meeting to order. Um, if we could stand for the invocation and pledge, please. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we ask you tonight to be with us and to be with the world and to be with this county and to be with this town and all the people and guide us during these times and help us to make good decisions in all of the places that we have to meet and we have to make those decisions. Thank you for our blessings. Amen. Please face the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, if you could do the roll call vote, please. Yes, sir. And if we could do those with the remotes. One is yes, two is no, or one is here, two is not. It's not here. <laughs> just hit one for now. Yeah. So if number two gets pushed over there, I'm running. <laughs> Um, I would oh, like to make a motion to excuse right. Commissioner Perkins Williams and Commissioner McLawhorn. Second. It's been moved and properly second. If we could now vote. No. <laughs> I really am here. You said one and two, didn't you? No. Okay, this time. I'll, I'll note the record is motion passed unanimously. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. I move that we uh, approve the agenda with the exception of removal of item one for decision. Second. It has been moved and properly second uh, that the agenda be. Approved and with the subject to the changes, if everyone could vote. Um, if we can now move on to public addresses to the board. Mr. Manager, before the um, attorney reads our general statement for folks to speak, you have several folks signed up on the same matter. If those folks wanted to, are speaking for a group, um, they can des on the same topic, they can designate who to speak. Um, so I would just invite folks who want to do it that way that they can do it that way, and then I'll turn it to the attorney. Yes, uh, Pitt County welcomes all comments on matters of public concern. Each person will be allowed up to three minutes to speak. A speaker representing a group of individuals in attendance will be allowed five minutes to speak on behalf of the group. A total of 30 minutes is set aside for public addresses to the board. Please state your name and address prior to speaking. The first one on your list is Philip Hardy. He submitted a written letter um, that I will read at the end to allow those who are um, present to speak first and not wait through that. Um, so the second speaker I have is Kristen Forget. Forget? And are you wanting to speak individually or for a group? As a group, please. And if for a group, could those folks who are you're speaking for stand, and then that would forfeit their time? Okay. Um, I think some of them also had something. To 
Okay, so if they want to speak, if everyone wants to speak individually, then it's three minutes per speaker. If you have a group who stands and wants to be represented by one voice, then the speaker would get five minutes. Okay. Um, but they would just have to stand first. So if no one stands, you'll have three. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Do I talk? Are we doing, sorry, are three, three minutes. minutes? Three minutes. Good evening. My name is Christina Forget. First and foremost, thank you to our Board of Commissioners Speaking for your continued service and dedication to the citizens Pull of Pitt County. Mic. All right. Thank you. Excuse me. Um, as I speak on behalf of a group for some of our Pitt County first responders. On March 19, 2020, Pitt County reported its first po positive case of COVID-19. Even before this date, Pitt County's first responders were preparing to answer the call. As of today, we have been in this pandemic for two years and 17 days. COVID-19 is a novel virus. According to the Webster Merriam Dictionary, novel is defined as new and not resembling something formerly known or used. During this entire pandemic with a new, unknown, and still researched virus, we have witnessed our first responders in public health, the Sheriff's Office, Pitt County EMS, Fire Rescue, and others who have worked hard to ensure our community's needs are served, all while doing so face-to-face, -face, in person, in an environment with an unknown virus. Many of these brave first responders contracted COVID-19 themselves or came home with the fear and anxiety of spreading it to their loved ones without knowing what the outcome would be. COVID-19 has reportedly affected our first responders physically, emotionally, and psychologically. According to a survey published by the CDC titled Symptoms of Depression, Anxiety, Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, and Suicidal Ideation Among State, Tribal, Local, and Territory Public Health Workers During the COVID-19 Pandemic, United States March through April 2021. In short, this article reports that 92.6% of the survey respondents reported directly working on COVID-19 related activities. The article states that the severity of symptoms of depression or PTSD increased as the percentage of work time spent directly on COVID-19 response activities and numbers of work hours in a typical <coughs> week increased. The article goes on to report that respondents reported experiencing traumatic events or stressors since March 2020. And I'll go forward since I'm not with five minutes, so I apologize. Our community has witnessed our Pitt County Health First responders work as a team while withstanding various weather conditions such as heat indexes that rose up to 110 degree Fahrenheit, pouring rain, gusty wind, ice, and snow, while offering COVID-19 testing to us even when they knew, did not know a vaccine or monoclonal antibody therapy would even be developed. They withstood any circumstance of weather while being exposed to chemicals from idling vehicle exhaust and while dressed in full PPE for hours on weekdays and weekends. Later in the pandemic, even when we read about short staffing in our county, our first line responders worked together in, to provide mass COVID-19 vaccination clinics to not only our Pitt County citizens, but also citizens that came from other states due to the availability of our COVID-19 vaccine. We watched on our televisions and we read on our news how our first responders not only carried a large load of providing COVID-19 services to our community, but still responded to crime, protest, health emergencies, fires, continuation of health services, even to perform home visits to those still in need of communicable disease services. Even in a pandemic, communicable disease, may I finish this last sentence? Oh. Is yeah. that okay? Oh, thank you so much. Uh, communicable diseases such as tuberculosis and syphilis, the need for immunizations against viruses such as polio and varicella, treatment of sexually transmitted infections <coughs> and prenatal services don't stop. Fire and health emergencies don't cease. Crime does not rest. Our responders continue to work in congregate increased risk settings, such as the detention center that was mentioned by our sheriff. Um, even with these reported short staffing in many areas, they have continued to serve for the love of Pitt County and its citizens. And I would like to take a moment to thank our first responders and essential workers and honor those who have suffered losses from this virus. And then it goes on, um, if it's okay to read. Just the last paragraph. I think that's probably that's sufficient. Yeah. Thank I you. For your permission? Yeah. I'm sorry? No, ma'am. Oh, thank you, though. Okay. Next person is Martha Engelke. Good evening. My name is Martha Engelke. I live at 220 Pine View Drive in Greenville. I taught at ECU College of Nursing for 37 years until recently I was the nursing representative on the Board of Health. I'm here to provide 
information related to the federal COVID relief funding. I know that there are many areas where this money is needed. From everything I have read and heard, the county commissioners have been thoughtful and deliberate in trying to do the most good for the most people. Citizens of Pitt County are fortunate that you have taken the time to hear the voices of citizens before making a final decision. When the pandemic began, most of us were terrified by, the easily, by this easily transmissible and potentially fatal disease. Most of us stayed home and, and tried to minimize the spread of infection. But some people, particularly public health staff, EMTs, and law enforcement, put themselves and their families at risk to help the sick and prevent the disease from spreading. Imagine what it was like to swab the nasal pharynx of a potentially infected person on a freezing cold morning before vaccines were available, or to transport a feverish patient who likely had COVID to the ICU at Viden. These people accepted a dangerous assignment, similar to a soldier or a sailor who serves in a war zone. The final rules about ARPA from the Department of Treasury support the use of these funds to recognize essential workers that had regular in-person interactions with patients. This is different than bonus pay which is given to all workers. The North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services supports premium or hazard pay for EMS, public health workers, and the Sheriff's Department up to the allowable maximum of $25,000. Everyone in Pitt County benefits from the health department. Whether you're a builder trying to get a permit or you're a pregnant woman who needs prenatal, prenatal care, the health department is there. When we are in hurricane season and shelters need to be set up, the health department makes this happen. During the pandemic, if you wanted to know how many people had COVID in any given week or search for guidance, on how to treat or prevent COVID, you could turn to the health department. Providing these services meant long hours and harassment at times for members of the community who didn't agree with the recommendations. In Pitt County, there has been a chronic shortage of staff at the health department, particularly public health nurses. This shortage has become a crisis. On March 10th, there were 36 vacancies at the health department. Many counties, and I'll name just a few of them, Henderson, Macon, Guilford, and Onslow, have had the same problem, and they are using ARPA funds to address the problem. As other health departments raise wages, we'll be at an even greater disadvantage. One sentence. We have tough decisions to make. You have tough de decisions to make over so many deserving projects. My request is that as you try to develop new initiatives with this funding, that you reserve some of the money to shore up existing services that are under threat. Thank you. Next, Mary Wilson. Good evening, commissioners. Good evening. Sorry. And thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I'll try to be brief. We've got the big game tonight. My name is Mary Wilson. I live at 115 Berkshire Drive here in Greenville, North Carolina, and I am a retired nurse. I've worked at uh, not just the hospital, but the School of Medicine as well as the College of Nursing. When the pandemic first started, I was one of the persons that wanted to get out there and do something. I had an opportunity and began to work uh, with many others in assisting with the mass, mass vaccination clinics through the Pitt County Health Department. It was even more rewarding for me to work with so many dedicated and experienced Pitt County personnel that truly held the front line so we as citizens could remain safe in such a storm of illness, disease, uncertainty, and death. During my time staffing these outreach clinics, I encountered some wonderful first responders, deputies, and health department staff who never complained or displayed any signs of frustration, fatigue, or distress. Many times, just their presence at the vaccine site allowed for a sense of calm and comfort. Some of these individuals came to me and shared their own experience of being ill with COVID or one, once or twice, while others concerning, uh, expressed their concern with their long COVID symptoms. All the while, they continued to serve our community 
with dedication, competence, perseverance to maintain the safety, health, and welfare of Pitt County. Now, there's no question we all may feel the impacts of this pandemic for many years to come, from the economic, social concerns to the physical and <coughs> mental toll to people choosing to leave their profession, including essential workers in public service and health care. Being a nursing faculty and clinician, I've witnessed many men and women that have both taught, that I both taught and personally worked with, who are struggling to find the joy and passion they had once caring for people. With Pitt County currently facing vacancies in public health, law enforcement, and emergency services, it's critical to identify how best to retain experienced individuals. Experience matters when it comes to the health and safety of our citizens. Recognizing the key roles of these public service employees, what they play now and they continue to play in the future for the protection of Pitt County is paramount to the sustainability of a quality public health and emergency services program. As a longstanding resident of this county and as an experienced nurse, I'd like to respectfully request that the county commissioners consider the use of allocated American Rescue funding to support these dedicated men and women by investing in them and the critical work of this pandemic, as well as future public health emergencies. And I'd like to end with a quote from the New England Journal of Medicine. There has never been a more important time to invest in the, work in the workforce. We have a window of opportunity to get ahead of two pandemics, the spread of the virus today and the harm to first responder well-being tomorrow. If we fail, we will pay the price for years to come. We must not neglect the, to care for those who care for us. Thank you all for your work and support of Pitt County. Art Schneider. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Art Schneider. I am a registered nurse, uh, 45 years. I am retired from Vitant Medical Center after 29 years. When COVID struck, uh, I reactivated my license and joined our local health department as a contract nurse. For the fa past 15 months, it has been my privilege and my honor to have worked alongside the health department staff and other first responders of our county who often put themselves and their families at risk in the process of caring for and protecting the residents of Pitt County, especially those most vulnerable. These were not tasks that could be done remotely from home or separated by plexiglass shields from the people they served. The work was unglamorous, rarely got the recognition that came with larger events put on by the medical center or the university. It was often done in residents' homes, in front of their grocery stores, trailer parks, and church halls. If people couldn't get to the health department for their vaccines, we brought the vaccines to them. When the ARP funds were distributed to local government, one of the suggested uses was as premium or hazard pay to compensate and retain those frontline workers who were at high risk during the COVID response. I know that there are other possible good uses for those funds and some may well be worth the while. But as one who has stood shoulder to shoulder with your frontline workers, I ask you not to forget them in your decision making. They are the ones who put themselves at risk to get us to this point. I believe that one of the best benefits we can give to the people of Pitt County is to assure that we retain and recruit trained first responders and frontline workers who will be ready to provide aid and care in time of need and emergency. Thank you. Keith Cooper. Uh, good evening. 
when my time is up, I would like to get my extra sentence in as well, my last <coughs> sentence. Um, this is an update on the journey for justice for Brandon Hardy. Uh, the family could not be here today because of an illness. Uh, but I stand before you today to update you on the journey to secure justice for the family of Brandon Hardy, who was killed by Robert Green at the home of Belinda Matthews on January the 1st of this year. As you know, the Pitt County Sheriff's Department did a sloppy job investigating the death, and they even refused to submit incriminating evidence to the Pitt County District Attorney. To some folks in the Sheriff's Department and the DA's office, Brandon Hardy is just another black man shot down in the streets. Believe it or not, no arrest has been made since January 1st. And one thing that we're concerned about is not just that no arrest has been made, but there's a lack of condolences, especially from public officials. Let me ask you guys on this dice, Pitt County Board of Commissioners, how many of you have contacted the decedent's family to offer your condolences? Probably none of you. Uh, I had a conversation with Mary Williams, Commissioner Williams, about a month ago, and I asked her about Brandon Hardy. She was like, who is Brandon Hardy? I decided to wear a T-shirt bearing his picture, but she's not here today. I want to show her who Brandon Hardy is, just in case she's not following it in the news media. Uh, I think Senator Don Davis may be here today. This is an election year. He's running for United States Congress. He, he's here, to, I think, to talk about nonprofits. That's a very good idea, but it's very strange that he's coming during an election year to talk about something like this. He didn't even call the family to offer condolences. Brandon was a son, a grandson, a father, uncle, nephew, cousin, and friend of many. He was somebody. I'm here to serve notice that his death will not be in vain. We will clean up the mess from the sheriff's and the DA's offices, uncover the cover-up, and expose the truth. The poet William Cullen Bryant had it right when he said, truth crushed to earth shall rise again. The injustice around Brandon's death is shameful. The philosopher Plato said that the worst form of injustice is pretended justice. Similarly, William Faulkner stated, never be afraid to raise your voice for honesty and truth and compassion against injustice and lying and greed. If people all over the world would do this, it would change the earth. Michael, biblical Michael, sixth chapter, says, he has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require to you but to do justice and love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Further, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was killed on this day 54 years ago, often quoted the book of Amos, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. The Sheriff's Department and DA's office picked the wrong family to play games with, uh, Janice. This family is lawyered up and ready, willing, and able to go all the way to the United States Supreme Court, if necessary, to get justice for Brandon Hardy. Finally, I believe that we will show that the Sheriff Paul Dance and D.A. Ferris Dixon supervise corrupt departments, there are some few good deputies here, within which crimes have been committed by various public officials. A songwriter once said, I was alone and idle. I was a sinner too. I heard a voice from heaven say there is work to do. I took my master's hand and I joined the Christian band. Now I'm out on the battlefield for my Lord. This is a difficult journey. Uh, some people say, let's put this in God's hands. 
President Kennedy, in 1961, his inaugural address said, God's work is our work. And finally, I want to quote to give encouragement to the family. 1 Corinthians 15, this is my last sentence. But be ye steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the works of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor shall not be in vain. Thank you very much. Angela Cooper. Greetings, everyone. I was hoping to see Murray Williams here. I'm sorry I missed her because I normally don't speak or whatever. But my name is Angela Cooper. I live in Belvoir, uh, which is in Pitt County, and Murray Williams is my representative. And um, she do call and send emails. I want to thank her for that. She keeps us up to date about everything that's going on. So I want to commend her for that. And I was going to tell her if she was here because I had somebody call me yesterday about voting for them. And I'm like, I don't even hear from the person, whatever. And I kept thinking, I said, I wonder if Murray gave her my number because she's the only one that really calls me, you know, up and in political season. So I do want to thank her and commend her. It's just not once every blue moon when people want to get voted for that they call. So that's something I can acknowledge her for. So I want to give her her props while she's, even though she's not here, she can still look at it or listen to some of you can tell her that Angela Cooper from her um, district said thank you. So Murray Williams, this goes out to you. Um, I can't say that about anybody else because I, I need to tell the truth. Now I'm here about Brandon Hardy. I mean, and the nurses, I was reading about the health care first um, responders. I really support you. I have a son that passed away around the time. He passed in his sleep. He got sick, and they said he didn't have COVID, so I understand. So, I'm, so I definitely support you. Please give them their funding, because without them, you really, you really need them. I know I want to thank you for that, and because I know of a lot of people that passed away during COVID. I know my shots, no problem. But there's still people out there for them to reach, so please help them. I'm here about Brandon Hardy's family. I can't imagine what the mother has gone through as far as a loss. I was surprised there was no arrest. I mean, most people arrest you for manslaughter or something, or even if it's self-defense, you prove yourself innocent. But the mother has been getting kind of threats from people, I guess people who campaign for Paul or whatever, they worry about her image and this, that, and the other. And then I'm wondering about what happened because the person admitted that he killed him. I mean, no arrest, nothing. They both work at the hospital, and I'm not going to mention kind of whatever names. I mean, I've read some of the emails, watched some of the videos when the person got shot, and I kept thinking, what in the world? Suppose that was one of your children. It's almost like somebody said, well, it was just a small matter. I told the mother that, who had a loss, her only child. So I know losing my only son. So I can only imagine that if that was my child, and they were worried about Paula's reputation, I'm thinking, if that was one of somebody else's child, you wouldn't be thinking about that. It's like a life that didn't mean anything. All lives are precious in God's sight. And I just want y'all to look at it. And then, then I kept thinking, well, first, um, the DA's office, if they really investigated it, then, you know, would they have plea deal them? I wonder how many plea deals they did. You know, that makes me concerned with somebody admitted to killing someone. You know, all lives are valuable. So if we can look into that and, and go beyond a political season, who might win, this, that, and the other, let's look at lives and, and how they matter no matter what. And that's all I want to say, and thank you, and God bless you, and don't forget to tell Murray Williams I said thank you. Belinda Anderson. Belinda Anderson. Mary Parker. I'm sorry, Mark Parker, if I have that correct, sorry. Good evening, my name is Mark Parker. I'm a member of CARE, a nonprofit group here in Pitt County. And I just want to say a couple of words, just discretion, choice, and causality. As you sit on the board, your discretion, your choice has causes has effects on what goes on in Pitt County. 
And I remember when everybody was getting their, their funding for the American Rescue Fund, I watched the news every morning. All of the other counties um, from the beginning announced all the things they were going to do with their funds. City Council, Board of, um, the Board of Commissioners, it was silent for a very long time. And as we, as the, as the citizens, we used our discretion to vote all of you in, in your positions. We made a choice, and now we're dealing with the causality of that choice, whether it's a good choice or it's a bad choice. As uh, being a member of CARE, we always went out to the community. We were the people, we're, we're the group of people, when we see a need, we go and do it. We're not prompted by anybody. We're prompted by the people of the community and as far as the vaccination and all the stuff going on, we were one of the first people to go out in the community and take it to the communities. We partnered with the health department. We ended up partnering with, uh, with Vida and some also. We're never there to look for any applause or anything like that. We just do what has to be done. And as you sit on, on your board, we want you to do what has to be done and what is right for this county. People, millions of dollars have been flown in all the counties around North Carolina. And usually, you know, I can, I'll, I'll give an example of most people will try to have a budget, be just, and do the right thing. Just like if you look at a person who really doesn't have a budget, get an income tax return, they can spend that, and then on, on frivolous things. Let's spend this money on stuff that is needed. I worked in healthcare for 26 years, still working in healthcare. I know, the, I know the plight of the nurses, but I also know the plight of the people that work in housekeeping. When I started at Vident back in 1992, I worked in dietary. But I moved from dietary up to um, radiology, and now I work at Abbott Medical. I'm a medical device specialist. And you know everybody matters across the spectrum. And our, our thing with care is, we look at everybody. Yes, we need first responders, health care, senior citizens. We need, we need help with education, educating people so everybody can go up at one time, not having a peak here and a valley there. And we, in order to do that, you need to go out in the community and talk to everyone. You need to know what's going on in your district, in District 1, District 2, 4, 5. You need to know what's going on. Do you know what's going on in, in your districts? Do you know? That's all I have to say. Discretion, choice, causality. Thank you. Um, Stacy, is it Staten? Terrific. Thank you. Oh wait, Tanya, is she not signed up? Since you're not on the list, please state your name before speaking. Okay. Um, my name is Tanya Foreman. I am the founder of CARE. Um, again, CARE is a nonprofit organization. We do work in the community in various sectors, including health equity, um, civic engagement, um, youth engagement, economic development, and financial literacy. Um, and wanted to mention number one support for what the health department is advocating for today um, in january 2021 when the vaccine was first released we were contacted by senior citizens in the community at that time there was a thought that there was a lot of resistance to the vaccine um, particularly in the black community because the senior citizens in the community were the first ones to receive the vaccine, I think it was 75 and older for the first tier, and then 65 and older for the second tier, um, we were contacted because their issues were information, access, and then accessibility to getting the vaccine. So I personally contacted Dr. Kim to establish a relationship with her so that we could take the vaccine in the community. We contacted other healthcare providers and they were not as open to do so. Through those efforts, we were able to vaccinate several thousand individuals in the community. 
not, we had a 97% show rate for our second doses. And we also had a good response for our, um, for the boosters. Now, the wonderful thing is that from January to, I would say about April the 15th of 2021, we averaged 155 people per vaccine clinic. We actually did not start hitting the hesitancy wall until around April 15th after what happened with J&J. &J. And then the numbers start dropping, particularly as we start, started dropping our mask mandates and things of that sort. What I do want to say is that this is needed. Um, the support for our healthcare professionals in the community is greatly needed, particularly those that serve um, the marginalized and BIPOC communities. And then community-based organizations need that same support because we're out there on the front lines putting boots on the ground every single week to make sure that people are served and that they're served equitably. Um, in addition to those efforts, just since January of this year, we have distributed more than 60,000 masks and well over 15,000 now at this point test kits. Again, to make sure that people have what they need to be able to um, protect themselves. So all I wanna do is just make sure that I'm advocating for the healthcare workers and community-based organizations, the ones that are actually doing the work to um, make sure that we're doing what we can do to be part of the solution together because we're all in this together and we're better together. Thank you. So Reverend Jerry Sproul. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Madam Manager, um, your rules will allot 30 minutes of total public comment and we started tonight at about 6.12 and we just eclipsed 31 minutes. How many more speakers do we have? Two speakers remaining on your list and one letter that was submitted um, this morning. Can we spend time? I think that's fine. People yeah. showed up. We'll Let's go, go on in here. Too. Reverend Jerry Sproul, if I have that correct. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. I'd like to thank you for all the service that you give and all that you've done for Pitt County and all the surrounding other areas. I am Jerry Sproul. I represent the Nathan R. Cobb Foundation, and uh, we are here today for the opportunity maybe to receive some funding for a pavilion that we're trying to build in the Farmville area. Uh, many of you are familiar with Nathan R. Cobb Foundation. We've given out over $50,000 in scholarships to graduating seniors so that they will have an opportunity to go out and be productive citizens. Uh, we are certainly uh, have listened to all of the uh, opportunities that have asked for monies today, and we certainly feel for the situation. But on behalf of the Nathan R. Cobb Foundation and our president, uh, Dr. Alvin Hobbs, board member uh, Deacon Rudy Cobb, we're here to say that we certainly would love for you to be able to fund this money for us so that we can complete the pavilion, so that when we have our fundraisers there, that we can help attain more scholarships for the citizens of Farmville and surrounding areas. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you. The last person I have signed up to speak, the last name appears to be Cobb, and I'm not sure I can read the first name. Is it um, R-E-D, maybe, Reginald? Is anyone else um, signed up on, on the list after Reverend Jerry Spruill, who is present? Please state your name. Alma Cobb Hobbs. Okay. Uh, did you sign up on the list? No, I did not. Oh. Yeah, no, I can't tell who that person is. Would you like to speak, ma'am? I would. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Nathan R. Cobb Senior Foundation. And I want to thank all of you for all the work you do to serve Pitt County. And I just want to add to Reverend Spruill's comment, the Nathan R. Cobb Senior Foundation has been 
Incorporated since 1999. We are going in our 22nd year. And we served the Bonville area in three areas, scholarships, families in distress, and Christian education. And during those 22 years, we have had um, the 50 plus more, over $100,000 in those three areas that we serve in Farmville. Uh, we have graduates that have come back to Farmville and have been guest speaker of our events who are pharmacists, dentists, and doing all kinds of great um, co careers um, and serving lots of Pitt County as well as other areas. So I just want to say we appreciate all you can do to help us sustain the efforts that we have started in Baltimore, North Carolina. The last one on your list is um, Philip Hardy, who sent an email to me um, that said, Mrs. Gallagher, please read the attached document into the record during the public comments portion of the commissioner's meeting on Monday night, 4-4-2022. Um, if uh, Mr. Uh, attorney would keep my time at three minutes. The letter says, good evening, commissioners. Please allow me five minutes as I'm speaking on behalf of a group. First, I would like to thank you for allowing my statement to be read tonight, and I sincerely hope that you will take real-life situations I present to you and agree to reconsider discussing the use of ARPA funding to provide premium slash hazard pay for the first responders in this county. During the commissioner's meeting on February 22nd, 2022, premium pay was presented as an option for expending the ARPA funding that was awarded by the federal government to Pitt County. I am thankful that this board has shown over the years that they have a tremendous amount of support for the mission and overarching goals of the Public Health Department. I hope that this personal account of how this pandemic has affected the staff that are considered first responders will ensure your continued commitment to public health support. The story begins in October of 2019. I found out that I was going to be a first-time father, and my wife and I were over the moon excited to be parents. Little did we know that in three short months, our world and our way of life will be completely turned upside down. My wife was and is currently employed as a nurse at the local health department. My wife, along with all of her coworkers and community partners who were also considered first responders, were expected to perform their normal duties and shoulder the responsibility of additional pandemic-related duties even in the face of the unknown of this virus. This virus was considered novel and there was no data, recommendation <coughs> for containment, vaccines, statistics, etc. Take a moment and reflect on the first time you had to go into public during the height of this pandemic. Many felt fear, even panic, partaking in the action of being around others. This feeling is what my wife and the other first responders felt daily throughout the entirely of their hours worked. Anyone who has to endure this type of increased fear and stress will likely see long-term effects of that down the road. In June of 2020, my wife and I welcomed our baby girl five weeks and one day premature. Even though she was mostly healthy, she had to spend eight days in the NICU due to breathing issues. No explanation be given, could be given regarding why she was premature as everything was medically appropriate throughout my wife's pregnancy and there was no evidence of something physically causing the premature delivery. I truly believe that the stress that my wife endured during the first months of the pandemic caused by constant increased risk of infection with COVID at work played a role in causing my daughter's premature arrival. After returning to work in August, she was terrified that she should contract the now proven deadly virus and bring it home to our infant and myself. She then endured that increased stress level until a vaccine was developed and distributed in late December 2020. Even with this stress increased risk and intense fear, she continued to show up for work to care for the most vulnerable residents in Pitt County. As a first responder, she understands that it is her duty to serve this county in the wake of natural disasters such as a hurricane. However, this virus was again unknown and very little was understood about the effect of protection or ways of transmission and normally her responses to these public health emergencies usually last two weeks maximum. This pandemic has lasted over two years and typically there is no possibility of familiar exposure due to this response. I have watched her come home daily. I'll finish the sentence. Um, daily seemingly defeated and losing her love for nursing over the past two years. The letter goes on another page, but to be consistent with your other speakers, I'll end at the last sentence. Thank you. That's all that we have on public addresses. We can now move on to the Employee Services Award. Yes. Um, we 
have several employees um, who are being recognized um, for their service to Pitt County government this evening um, as a result of the pandemic and all meetings being at 6 p.m. rather than having those employees present to receive their awards um, we have notified them by letter those with um, 20 years of service um, receive their special gift and I'll just read their names if you'll allow mr. chairman um, for five years of service Kenneth R Bran engineering Andrew Douglas Davis, Sheriff's Office, Ivy Dante Dixon, Sheriff's Office, Deandra L. Francis, Social Services, Carla Sue Hansen, Emergency Management, Loretta Lynn Johnson, Farmer's Market, Taylor Michelle Mercer, Detention Center, Portia Sherry Mazel, Public Health, Bobby Ray Morris, Emergency Management, Dolores Yolanda Newberg, Social Services, Chandler Thomas Sutton, Emergency Management, Janin Nelson Van Honk, Social Services, and Rhonda M. Waters, Social Services. In the 10-year category, there's one recipient, Ralph Emerson McLawhorn, in the Sheriff's Office. For 15 years of service, we recognize John P. Caton in Management Information Systems, GIS, Melinda Cox, Detention Center, Lynn C. Faircloth, Public Health, Rose P. Newton, Emergency Management, and Michael T. Trongone in the Detention Center. For 20 years of service, Byron L. Allen, Detention Center, William J. Crowley, Sheriff's Office, Brenda E. Dancy, Social Services, note that she retired April 1st, 2022, Karen R. Davis Jones, Social Services, Jonas N. Hill IV, Planning, Bathsheba Smith, Detention Center, and Rhonda L. Topping in the Sheriff's Office. Uh, being recognized for 25 years of service, Bonnie R. Lesko Roberts in Public Health, and LaChauncey K. Staten in the Sheriff's Office. And then there is one 30-year recipient, um, Lemuel Capehart Jr. with the Detention Center. We would offer these employees a round of applause in thanks for their service to the We can now move on to items for reports. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, we're excited about giving you an update tonight about our uh, land use plan and where we're moving along with the update of it. We've got several different uh, activities that have already started. Uh, one is on your screen right now, and that's the naming of the new plan. Our steering committee, which is also known as your Pitt County Planning Board, at its last meeting, uh, decided to entitle the new plan Envision Pitt County 2045. So with that, um, before I bring up our consultant that's assisting with this, uh, just a reminder that this is your guide as we move forward in making land development decisions, whether they're rezonings or other amendments to regulations, this will serve as your guide for many years, just as our previous versions have. We had our first land use plan developed back in 1990. We've had two subsequent updates. One, of course, was when we went countywide with uh, zoning back uh, in 2003. So the, it preceded that version and served us very well with our countywide uh, zoning ordinance. Um, over the last 10 years, since our previous update, uh, we have had two corridor plans that have been uh, developed and approved by this board. Uh, those were for two corridors that were bringing anticipated development to those areas, both the Southwest Bypass and NC43 South. So those are two updates that we're currently using and guide, as a guide for uh, some of the development in those areas. Just a reminder also, uh, state legislation now requires that uh, we have an up-to-date land use plan and that we use that for any of our decisions, such as these rezonings. So uh, with that, tonight, we'd like to introduce Chad Seary, who's here with Stewart Consulting. Um, their group was selected uh, with the help of NCDOT to ensure that we bring this plan up to date and Chad is going to tell you a little bit more about our process and our schedule. So, Chad. Thank you, James. Um, good evening. Uh, it's good to see some of your faces again. Um, we are no stranger to Pitt County. 
Um, it's good to be back in the area. Um, I'm an East Carolina grad. I'm also a native of Eastern North Carolina. So anytime I get a chance to come back, other than football Saturdays is, is good. Um, uh, what I want to do is talk a little bit about uh, our firm and our team that's working on this project. Um, James did a great job of giving an overview of where we are. Uh, I'm going to talk about our schedule um, and kind of the overview of, of how we get from point A to point B. Uh, and then I'm going to dive a little bit in public engagement because that's a really important part of this process um, as we go through it. So a little bit about our firm. Um, we're a 28-year-old firm. Um, our main office is located in Raleigh, so about an hour's drive away. We also have offices in Durham, Charlotte, Wilmington, and Columbia, South Carolina. Um, the great thing I love about our company is that we have eight different practice areas. So not only do we work in, and I get to work in community planning, we also get to work with our transportation group, our uh, landscape architecture group, our uh, uh, civil engineering group, and all the other great groups that we have with our firm. Um, we like to think that um, we really think strengthen communities by having all these things and being able to collaborate uh, in an environment that serves the communities that we work. Um, we're about a 200-person firm, um, and we've grown tremendously uh, since the uh, inception of our group um, 28 years ago. Um, before I get into our project team, um, I do want to let you know we are very, very familiar with Pitt County. Uh, James mentioned the two um, recent corridor plans that were done. We were very fortunate to work on both of those plans. Uh, we worked on the uh, town of Aden and also the town of Winterville's comprehensive plans, and we're actually wrapping up uh, the town of Farmville's uh, in the next couple of months. So we're very, very familiar with Pitt County, um, and again, it's really great to be back in the area. Uh, again, my name is Chad Sari. Uh, I'm the practice leader of our municipal planning group, sorry, community planning group. We just changed our name. Um, and I had about 20 years of local government experience before I joined the consulting world. So I um, actually worked on um, planning staff for many years, did some administration, uh, have served on a planning board, and I'm actually an elected official in Wake Forest, the town that I live in. So I can appreciate the, the seat that you sit in um, and the things that you, um, you serve the community with. Um, Jake Petrosky is our, our project manager. He could not be here tonight, so I'm, I'm standing in for him. Um, he is uh, very passionate about what he does and will be the point of contact with um, the county staff. Um, he's supported by the members of our team, Andrea, Allison, Jaquasia, and Stephen uh, Faber from our team. And we're also um, working with WSP, our transportation consultant, and that's Fred and Shivang. Um, they'll be working with us on that as well. And they were part of the um, NC43 um, team and also with the Southwest Bypass team. So, again, they're very, very familiar with the area. So as far as the schedule and process, this is about a 14-month process, give or take uh, a few a month or here or there. Um, we really kind of kicked this off in late December or January when the contract was initially approved. Um, and there's a lot of things that go on with this process. Um, the first five to six months is really what we call the project initiation phase, and that's where we get to really learn more and understand the community. Uh, we really collect data and understand uh, a lot more, dive more into the community as a whole. Um, we worked on branding the project, which you, uh, James had mentioned earlier. Um, we've had the kickoff. We've met with your uh, staff. Um, we've had a steering committee meeting who is your planning board and talked with them about the process. Um, we've got some stakeholder meetings coming up, and there's a community survey that will be released soon um, to get some input from the community. Um, once we get done with uh, phase one, we'll move into phase two, and that's really the heart of the project. We'll um, have several public workshops. Um, we'll be working in working groups, um, drafting the visions, the goals, the future land use map, um, and then continuing to meet with our steer the steering committee who will really serve kind of the shepherder of this project. Um, and then we'll move into the implementation phase, which is towards uh, the end of this year and, and perhaps early, early of 2023, um, and have the uh, plan go before your planning board for recommendation and then the elected body for adoption. So just a little bit about what a comprehensive plan is. It's a long-range document. Um, it really serves as a forecast that's based on past trends and data that we've gathered. Um, it covers a time frame of 10 to 20 years. Um, and it serves as a guidance. It serves as a guidance for land use decisions, for rezonings, um, for intensity, for design. Um, but it also serves as a guide for staffing and programs and infrastructure investment um, that you may look to in uh, the next two decades. Um, it's a collaborative, collaborative um, process. 
Um, we like to say it's a community conversation. Um, there's a lot of public engagement that's involved with this thing. Um, there's a lot of uh, input that we will receive while we're drafting this. And so we like to think of it as a community conversation. And last but not least, it is a policy document. Um, it is something that may lay the groundwork for your staff to do some text amendments later on down the road, perhaps in their zoning or subdivision regulations. And again, it, it is not just about land use and development. That's a lot what we talk about, especially in a growing community. But it does include, uh, re will include recommendations regarding open space and natural resources, parks and recreation and programming, uh, housing, uh, infrastructure and services, and also economic development. So all of these things will be part uh, of the plan when we get towards the end with recommendations. And last few slides is really dealing with public engagement because this is critically important. Uh, any process that you go through, you want to have adequate public engagement. Um, you also want to be very transparent. Um, so as I mentioned, we have a steering committee, uh, your planning board that will be working with us throughout this process. Um, we have stakeholder interviews that are coming up. Um, there'll be multiple public meetings uh, where people can come out and learn more about it and offer their input. Uh, there'll be a community survey that's released. Um, and then uh, the website has been launched as of last week or maybe two weeks ago. Um, that's called Envision Pitt County 2045. Um, so there's a lot of avenues to learn about this project, find out more about it, and provide input. And as far as public engagement goes, as I mentioned, we'll continue to have steering committee meetings. Um, the website has officially been launched. Uh, the branding is Envision Pitt County 2045. This is something that uh, the, the planning board really liked, and uh, we were able to get the domain name, <laughs> which was really important, so we were able to make it stick. Um, the community survey, we just received some uh, final comments on that, and that'll be released pretty soon. Um, stakeholder interviews are coming up uh, towards the end of April. Um, and then as we move into May and June, uh, there'll be four community visioning workshops. And it was very important for us to try and go out to the community and have these. So we're going to try to divide them in maybe the four quadrants of the county. So we actually go out to these areas rather than having them in one central location. Um, and then future, in the future, there'll be some topic and working group meetings. So a lot, again, I don't want to overemphasize it, but public engagement is critically important to the success of this plan. And as I close, um, I just want to say again, thank you. It's great to see you all again. Um, this is actually the home page of the website of where the plan and all the information will be housed. Uh, again, it's www.envisionpittcounty2045.com. I encourage you all to go and visit it and uh, for all those who are listening and watching uh, to be a part of this as well. Um, I will close, and if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Are you ready, Mr. Chair? Um, so the next item on the agenda is mine. Uh, this is on the agenda at Commissioner Colson's request. Um, on March 15th, the Court of Appeals issued a uh, written decision concluding that the City of Greenville's red light camera program was un unconstitutional under the North Carolina Constitution. Um, specifically, they, they said it violated the fines and forfeitures clause, which essentially says that all fines of, uh, and penalties associated with the breach of criminal laws belongs to the school system. Um, last week, Pitt County School Board and the City of Greenville requested the North Carolina Supreme Court to issue a stay, a pause, or a hold on the Court of Appeals decision. And late last week, the Supreme Court granted that request. Um, so they've issued a temporary stay, essentially putting on hold that underlying decision. So. Suffice it to say, we do not yet know the final outcome of that litigation, and it may be quite a while before we do so. Happy to keep the board informed of any um, progress or future developments, if you so direct me. Thank you, Mr. Attorney. Yeah. Madam Manager. Yes, yeah, so on your manager's report this evening, I have a few items. First, your meeting dates. The next meeting, April 18th, 2022 at 6 p.m. and May 2nd, 2022 at 6 p.m. here in this auditorium, remaining fully live and in person. Um, a reminder of your April 11th, 2022 um, special called board meeting, which is a workshop dinner discussion from 5.30 to 7 p.m. at Julep Restaurant. April 19th from 11 to 1 in the afternoon, um, all commissioners are invited to attend the SNS Farms Family Farm event at the uh, Sutton, property, Sutton Farm in Farmville. Item D, April 21st, 2022, from 4 to 7 p.m., is the Pitt County Career Fair, which will be held in the Mark W. Owens Jr. Auditorium in the Agricultural um, 
Center Auditorium. We invite all folks interested in employment with Pitt County to visit that career fair April 21st from 4 to 7. Next item is a reminder on April 27th, 2022 from 10 to 11, the North Carolina Department of Transportation is hosting a local officials meeting relating to the closure of Route 222 um, at the Belvoir Fire Department. All commissioners are invited to attend. Um, item number F, uh, within the chairman's authority, he signed a proclamation designating April 2022 as North Carolina 811 Safe Digging Month. And then as item G, I believe we have Dr. Rouse in the audience. Um, if he would come forward and we could step down, Mr. <coughs> chairman. Um, the chairman also signed a proclamation designating April 2022 as National Community College Month. And I'd like to read that proclamation and present it to Dr. Rouse, if I may. Do you need a motion? Um, no, because this was in your chairman's authority. Okay. We are not necessarily set up from the camera perspective to do this, so we're just going to do it right out front, and I'm going to speak loudly if I may. Thank you, Dr. Rouse, for being here. Um, this is a proclamation designating um, April 2022 as National Community College Month, and it reads, whereas Pitt Community College is one of the 58 institutions comprising the North Carolina Community College System, which provides high quality, affordable, and accessible educational opportunities to nearly 700,000 students annually in an effort to develop a globally competent workforce and improve lives. And whereas Pitt Community College serves more than 20,000 curriculum and continuing education students annually and has proven itself to be a valuable resource of higher education in Pitt County, since it was established in March 1961. And whereas Pitt Community College has demonstrated exceptional dedication to helping students, particularly low-income students and students of color, achieve their goals for academic success, personal growth, and economic opportunity by fulfilling the three-year commitment to the Achieving the Dream National Network. And whereas Pitt Community College offers customized training to prepare a skilled local workforce capable of sustaining existing businesses and industries while attracting new ones, and operation small business centers to assist local entrepreneurs with getting their businesses started and operating efficiently. And whereas Pitt Community College is a leader in healthcare training in North Carolina, was recently deemed one of the nation's most promising places to work in community colleges by diverse issues in higher education magazine, ranked among the nation's leaders in awarding associate degrees to African Americans, and has been regularly designated a military friendly institution. GI Jobs Magazine. And whereas Pitt Community College has made a $228.1 million impact on the community during the 2019-20 fiscal year and continually advances Pitt County's business and education community while generating a positive return on investment to its major stakeholder groups, students, taxpayers, and society. And whereas Pitt Community College is committed to educating and empowering people for success while adhering to the North Carolina Community College System's original mission of keeping the door open to all individuals seeking higher education and taking them from where they are educationally to where they want to go. And whereas, in recognition of the important contribution of community and technical colleges to the nation's educational system, in 1985, the U.S. Congress authorized and requested then-President Ronald Reagan to issue Proclamation 5418, establishing a National Community College Month. Therefore, be it resolved that the Pitt County Board of Commissioners do hereby proclaim April 2022 as Pitt Community College Month in Pitt County, adopted this the fourth day of April 2022, signed within the authority of Mike Fitzpatrick, Chairman, and attested by Kimberly W. Hines. If Mr. Chairman, you will present that to Dr. a few more items on the report. Um, you may have noticed on your way into the building this evening, there is a pinwheel garden 
for April, which is child abuse prevention, um, for child abuse prevention. And finally, item E, I have a report on a settled workers' compensation claim as required by law to report out that a fully executed clincher agreement for Alexander Anthony's workers' compensation claim um, was resolved from an injury on 10-1-20. The amount of the settlement was zero dollars in exchange for waiver of su a subrogation lien. But it was, although there was no money associated with it, it was a settlement agreement nonetheless, um, which is required to be reported out. And then I have one last item that's not on your printed agenda to make you aware of, and that is so that the board is aware Tradeland Company is the, is the company that we lease um, the 9th Street offices for, for the Sheriff's Office Patrol Division. Um, Tradeland has provided 60 days notice under the terms of our lease with them. They provided notice on March 31st, um, as required by the lease, that the Sheriff's Office must vacate that 9th Street property within 60 days. So just to let you know, we are securing alternate space um, for the Sheriff's Office effective June 1. Um, and we will keep, Tim Corley is um, on top of that. He has already been investigating other options for space, has been in conversation with the Sheriff's Office, and we will keep the board advised if it should have a budgetary impact. That's all that I have for your report this evening. Thank you. This time, I entertain a motion for the items. I so for move for Second. items for consent. Second. It's been moved and properly second. If everyone could please vote. Okay. passes unanimously. unanimously. We can now move on to items for discussion. Madam Manager. Yes. Um, Commissioner um, Ann Floyd Huggins had um, uh, requested that we add an item for discussion onto your agenda about the renaming of Hospital Drive. As you're aware, Hospital Drive is the privately owned road that comes alongside the county office building. Um, and Commissioner Floyd Huggins indicated that she had had several contacts from people who are confused by that name. So as a result of that request, I consulted James Rhodes, our planning director, who um, confirmed the process. It seems to be a fairly straightforward process to rename a private road. Um, it would just, we would need to have a name suggested by the Board of Commissioners um, that would be presented to the City of Greenville to assure that it's not duplicated or confusing um, with regard to any other road names. Um, once you receive that confirmation, it would come back to this board for a resolution approving the new name and then be submitted to the city for them to update their records. So this item is for discussion to hear of any potential names, to hear first whether or not the board would like to rename Hospital Drive, and second, if so, what potential name you would like us to submit to the city. I'd love for us to do it. At, uh, we talked Thursday about uh, People's Way um, as a possible name. That's a good idea. I like that. Okay. I like that too. Are there any other suggestions? If not, we can submit people's way to the city, and if it is not duplicated, I can bring that back in the form of a resolution for formal approval. Okay. We need that in the form of a motion. We need a motion. Um, We're going to just check back. You want yes. to make a motion? Go yeah. ahead if you would make a motion to uh, submit. I move that we re rename Hospital Drive to People's Way. I second it. Been moved and properly second. We could all vote, please. I keep forgetting I got the clip. I keep wanting to get that done. And motion passes. We can now move on to items for decision. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the first item um, is on page um, 63 of your packet. This is the second reading of proposed amendments to the noise ordinance. Um, just to quickly summarize those, those changes would uh, eliminate the requirement that someone be specially designated to enforce a noise ordinance and would be enforceable by any member of the sheriff's office. It increases possible criminal penalties from currently $50 to possibly $400, and for the first time adds civil penalties, $100 for a first offense, $200 for a second offense and $400 for each subsequent offense. Um, and I'd be happy to try to answer any questions if there are any. This time, entertain a motion to approve. I would like to move that approval. Second. 
Any further discussion? It has been moved and properly second. Take the vote, please. Motion passes. Madam Manager. Um, on page 71 of your packet, you have a list of um, reappointments to the Animal Services Advisory Board. It is being recommended that um, Mr. Jack Brock, Ms. Allison Dale, Mr. Matthew Goddard, and Mr. Michael Nelms be appointed, uh, that um, Brock, Dale, Goddard, be reappointed and Michael Nelms be appointed to fill the at-large positions on the Animal Services Advisory Board. Motion to approve. Second. It's been moved and properly second. Please vote. Motion passes. Madam Manager. Um, your last item um, for action is appointments to the Leroy James Farmers Market Advisory Committee. Um, the Leroy James Farmers Market Policy Committee is recommending that Ms. Wada Juana Haddock, a farm vendor, and Ms. Patricia Shigas Roman at large be appointed to the Leroy James Farmers Market Policy Committee. If appointed, Ms. Haddock would replace Andy Jansen, whose term expired and will serve a full time that expires April 8, 2025. And if appointed, Ms. Shigas Roseman, who is in the audience this evening, will be replacing Joni McClawhorn, whose term expired and will serve a full term that expires April 8, 2025. I'd like to make a motion that Ms. Haddock and Ms. Uh, Roman be appointed. Second. It's been moved and properly second. <clears throat> motion passes. We can now move on to Commissioner comments. Commissioner Ward. No comments. Commissioner. No. Uh, yeah, I would like to uh, say that on April 16th, uh, Fountain is having an Emma Dupree celebration, um, a noted herbalist who spent her life in Falkland and Fountain, and because of the Pomeroy Foundation in upstate New York and the North Carolina Folklife Foundation, uh, we're setting a uh, historic marker on Highway uh, uh, Downtown Fountain, and there'll be a series of events on that date, and that's April 16th, beginning at 10 a.m. Thank you. Commissioner White. No comment. Commissioner Nunn? No comment. Commissioner Colson? No. Motion to adjourn. Second. It's been moved and properly second. Commissioner Nunley? Nope. Motion to the Meeting is adjourned. Thank you.